Chapter 11 Tearing at the Chains The middle ground had now collapsed. The ditch which ran between us and our custodians was now a deep moat, and we stood on opposite slopes, taking the measure of the situation. Stood is, of course, a manner of speaking. We went to work daily with our new foremen, some of them secretly elected and coaxed into serving the common cause, others not new to the job but now so sympathetic, so friendly, so solicitous as to be unrecognizable. We were never late for work line-up. We never let each other down. There were no shirkers. We chalked up a good day's work. You might think that our masters could be pleased with us and that we could be pleased with them. They had quite forgotten how to yell and to threaten. They no longer hauled us into the disciplinary barracks for petty reasons. They appeared not to notice that we had stopped doffing our caps to them. Major Maximenko did not get up for work line-up in the morning, but he did like to greet the columns at the guardhouse of an evening and to crack a joke or two while they were marking time there. He beamed upon us with fat complacency, like a Ukrainian rancher somewhere in the Tavrida, surveying his countless flocks as they come home from the steppe. They even started showing us films occasionally on Sundays. There was just one thing. They went on plaguing us with the Great Wall of China. All the same, we and they were thinking hard about the next stage. Things could not remain as they were. We could not be satisfied with what had happened, nor could they. Someone had to strike a blow. But what should be our aim? We could now say out loud, without looking nervously around, whatever we liked, all those things which had seethed inside us, and freedom of speech, even if it was only there in the camp, even though it had come so late, was a delight. But could we hope to spread that freedom beyond the camp, or carry it out with us? Of course not. What further political demands could we put forward? We just couldn't think of any. Even if it had not been pointless and hopeless, we couldn't think of any. We, from where we were, could not demand that the country should change completely, nor that it should give up the camps. It would have rained bombs on us. It would have been natural for us to demand that our cases be reviewed, and that unjust sentences imposed without reason be quashed. But even that looked hopeless. In the foul fog of terror that hung thickly over the land, the cases brought against most of us, and the sentences passed, seemed to our judges fully justified and they had almost made us believe it ourselves. Besides, judicial review was a phantom process which the crowd could get no grip on, and there could be no easier way to cheat us. They could make promises, spin out the proceedings, keep coming back to ask more questions. It could drag on for years. Suppose somebody was suddenly declared free and removed. How could we be sure that he was not on his way to be shot, or to another prison, or to be sentenced afresh? Hadn't the farce of the board already shown us how easy it is to create illusions? The board was for packing us off home, even without judicial review. Where we were all of one mind and had no doubts at all was that the most humiliating practices must be abolished. The huts must be left unlocked overnight and the latrine buckets removed. Our number patches must be taken off. Our labor must not be completely unpaid. We must be allowed to write twelve letters a year. But all this and more, indeed the right to twenty-four letters a year, had been ours in the corrective labor camps, and had it made life there livable? As to whether we should fight for an eight-hour working day, there was no unanimity among us. We were so unused to freedom that we seemed to have lost all appetite for it. Ways and means were also discussed. How should we present our demands? What action should we take? Clearly we could do nothing with bare hands against modern arms, and therefore the course for us to take was not armed rebellion, but a strike. On strike we could, for instance, tear off the number patches ourselves. But the blood in our veins was still slavish, still servile. For all of us at once to remove the odious numbers from our persons seemed a step as daring, as audacious, as irrevocable as, say, taking to the streets with machine guns. And the word, strike, sounded so terrifying to our ears that we sought firmer ground, by refusing food, when we refused to work, it seemed to us that our moral right to strike would be reinforced. We felt that we had some sort of right to go on a hunger strike, but to strike in the ordinary sense. Generation after generation in our country had grown up believing that the horrifyingly dangerous and, of course, counter-revolutionary word strike belonged with entente, denikin, 
Kulak sabotage, Hitler. So that by voluntarily undertaking an unnecessary hunger strike, we voluntarily agreed to undermine the physical strength which we needed for the struggle. Fortunately, no other camp seems to have repeated Echibustus's mistake. We went over and over the details of the proposed work stoppage hunger strike. The general disciplinary code for camps, recently made applicable to us, told us that they would reply by locking us in our huts. How then should we keep in touch with each other and pass decisions about the further conduct of the strike from hut to hut? Someone had to devise signals and get the huts to agree from which windows they would be made and at which windows they would be picked up. It was talked over in various places, in one group and another. It seemed inevitable and desirable, yet because it was so novel, somehow impossible. We could not imagine ourselves suddenly assembling, finishing our discussions, resolving and... But our custodians did not have to organize secretly. They had a clear chain of command. They were more accustomed to action. They were less likely to lose by acting than by failing to act. And they got their blow in first. After that, events took on a momentum of their own. At peace and at ease on our familiar bunks, in our familiar sections, we greeted the new year, 1952. Then, on Sunday, January the 6th, the Orthodox Christmas Eve, when the Ukrainians were getting ready to observe the holiday in style, they would make kutya, fast till the first star appeared, and then sing carols. The doors were locked after morning inspection, and not opened again. No one had expected this. The preparations had been secret and sly. Through the windows we saw them herding a hundred or more prisoners from the next hut through the snow to the guardhouse with all their belongings. Were they being moved to another camp? Then it was our turn. Warders came, and officers with cards. They called out names from the cards. Outside with all your things, including mattresses, just as they are. Don't empty them. So that was it. A regrouping. Guards were posted by the break in the Chinese wall. It would be bricked up next day. We were taken past the guardhouse and herded, hundreds of us, with sacks and mattresses, like refugees from a burning village, around the boundary fence, past another guardhouse, into the other camp area, passing those who were being driven in the opposite direction. All minds were busily trying to work out who had been moved, who had been left behind, what this reshuffle meant. What our masters had in mind became clear soon enough. In one half of the camp, Camp Division No. 2, only the Ukrainian nationalists, some 2,000 of them, were left. In the half to which we had been driven, and which was to be Camp Division No. 1, there were some 3,500 men belonging to all the other ethnic groups, Russians, Estonians, Lithuanians, Latvians, Tatars, Caucasians, Georgians, Armenians, Jews, Poles, Moldavians... Germans, and a variegated sprinkling of other nationalities picked up from the expanses of Europe and Asia. In a word, our country, one and indivisible. Curious, this, the thinking of the MVD, which should have been enlightened by a supranational doctrine called socialism, still followed the same old track, that of dividing nation from nation. The old teams were broken up, new ones were mustered. They would go to new work sites, live in new huts. In short, a complete reshuffle. There was enough to think about here for a week, not just one Sunday. Many links were snapped, people were thrown together in different combinations, and the strike, which had seemed imminent, was broken in advance. Oh, they were clever. The whole hospital, the mess hall, and the club remained in the Ukrainian camp division. We were left instead with the camp jail, while the Ukrainians, the banderists, the most dangerous rebels, had been moved farther away from it. What did this mean? We soon learned what. Reliable rumors went around the camp, from the working prisoners who took the gruel to the BUR, that the stoolies in the safe deposit had grown cheeky. Suspects, picked up here and there, two or three at a time, had been put in with the stoolies who were torturing them in the common cell, choking them, beating them, trying to make them sing and to name names. Who's doing the slashing? This made the whole scheme as clear as daylight. They were using torture. Not the dog pack themselves. They probably had no authorization for it and might run into trouble. So they had entrusted the stoolies with the job. 
Find your murderers yourselves. The stoolies were all eagerness, no shot in the arm needed, and this was one way for those parasites to earn their keep. That was why the banderists had been moved away from the BUR, so that they could not attack it. We were less of a worry. Docile people of different races, we would not make common cause. The rebels were in the other place, and the wall was four meters high. So many deep historians have written so many clever books, and still they have not learned how to predict those mysterious conflagrations of the human spirit, to detect the mysterious springs of a social explosion, nor even to explain them in retrospect. Sometimes you can stuff bundle after bundle of burning tow under the logs, and they will not take. Yet up above, a solitary little spark flies out of the chimney, and the whole village is reduced to ashes. Our three thousand had no plans made, were quite unprepared. But one evening, on their return from work, the prisoners in a hut next to the BUR began dismantling their bunks, seized the long bars and cross pieces, ran through the gloom. There was a darkish place on one side of the BUR. To batter down the stout fence around the camp jail, they had neither axes nor crowbars because there never are any inside the camp area, unless perhaps they had begged a couple from the maintenance yard. There was a hammering noise. They worked like a team of good carpenters, levering the planks away as soon as they gave, and the grating protests of twelve-centimeter nails could be heard all over the camp. It was hardly the time for carpenters to be working, but at least it was a workmanlike noise. And at first, neither the men on the towers, nor the warders, nor the other prisoners, thought anything of it. Life was following its usual evening routine. Some teams were going to supper, others straggling back from supper. Some making for the medical section, others for the stores, others for the parcels office. All the same, the warders were worried. Hustled over to the BUR, to the half-dark wall where all the activity was, and raced like scalded cats to the staff barracks. Somebody rushed after a warder with a stick. Then, to provide full musical accompaniment, somebody started breaking windows in the staff barracks with stones or a stick. The staff's window panes shattered with a merry, menacing crash. What the lads had in mind was not to raise a rebellion, nor even to capture the BUR. No easy matter. But merely to pour petrol into the stoolie's cell and toss in something burning, meaning watch your step, we'll show you yet. A dozen men did force their way through the gap knocked in the BUR fence. They started tearing around looking for the cell. They had made a guess at the window, but were not sure. Then they had to dislodge the muzzle, give someone a leg up, pass the petrol pail. But machine gun fire from the towers suddenly rattled across the camp, and they never did start their blaze. The warders and chief disciplinary officer Machikovsky had fled from the camp and informed division. Machikovsky too had been pursued by a prisoner with a knife, had run by way of the shed in the maintenance yard to a corner tower, shouting, "You in the tower! Don't fire! I'm a friend!" and scrambled through the outer fence. He was hacked to pieces just the same, not, however, by us, but by the thieves who replaced us in Ekibastuts in 1954. He was harsh but courageous. There's no denying that. Division, where can we now inquire the names of the commanders? Gave telephonic instructions for the corner towers to open fire from machine guns on three thousand unarmed people who knew nothing of what had happened. Our team, for instance, was in the mess hall, and we were completely mystified when we heard all the shooting outside. It was one of fate's little jokes that this took place on January the twenty-second, new style, January the ninth, old style, the anniversary of Bloody Sunday, which until that year was marked in the calendar as a day of solemn mourning. For us, it proved to be Bloody Tuesday, and the butchers had much more elbow room than in Petersburg. This was not a city square, but the step, with no witnesses, no journalists, or foreigners around. But it is interesting to note that it was about this time that Soviet calendars stopped marking Bloody Sunday, as though it was, after all, a fairly ordinary occurrence and not worth commemorating. Firing at random in the darkness, the machine gunners blasted away at the camp area. True, the shooting did not last long, and most of the bullets probably passed overhead. But quite a few of them were lower. And how many does a man need? They pierced the flimsy walls of the huts. And as always happens, wounded not those who had stormed the BUR, 
but others who had no part in it. Nonetheless, they now had to conceal their wounds, stay away from the medical section, wait like dogs for time to heal them, otherwise they might be identified as participants in the mutiny. Somebody, after all, must be plucked out of the faceless mass. In hut number nine, a harmless old man, nearing the end of a ten-year sentence, was killed in his bed. He was due to be released in a month's time. His grown-up sons were serving in the same army as those who blazed away at us from the towers. The besiegers left the prison yard and quickly dispersed to their barracks, where they had to put their bunks together again so as to cover their traces. Many others took the shooting as a warning to stay inside their huts. Yet others, on the contrary, poured out excitedly and scurried about the camp, trying to understand what it was all about. By then there were no warders left in the camp area. The staff barracks was empty of officers and terrible jagged holes yawned in its windows. The towers were silent. The curious and the seekers after truth roamed the camp. Suddenly the gates of our camp division were flung wide and a platoon of convoy troops marched in with Tommy guns at the ready, firing short bursts at random. They fanned out in all directions and behind them came the enraged warders with lengths of iron pipe, clubs or anything else they had been able to lay their hands on. They advanced in waves on every hut, combing the whole camp area. Then the Tommy gunners were silent and halted while the warders ran forward to flush out prisoners in hiding, whether wounded or unhurt, and beat them unmercifully. All this became clear later, but at the time we could only hear heavy firing in the camp area and could see and understand nothing in the half-dark. A lethal crush developed at the entrance to our hut. The prisoners were so anxious to shove their way in that no one could enter. Not that the thin boards of the hut walls gave any protection against bullets, but once inside a man ceased to be a mutineer. I was one of those by the steps. I remember very well my state of mind, a nauseated indifference to my fate, a momentary indifference whether I survived or not. Why have you fastened your hooks on us, curse you? Why must we go on paying you till the day we die for the crime of being born into this unhappy world? Why must we sit forever in your jails? The prison sickness, which is at once nausea and peace of mind, flooded my being. Even my constant fear for the as yet unrecorded poem and the play I carried within me was in abeyance. In full view of the death which was wheeling towards us in military or greatcoats, I made no effort at all to push through the door. This was the true convict mentality. This was what they had brought us to. The doorway gradually cleared, and I was among the last to go through. Shots rang out at this point, amplified by the hollow building. The three bullets they fired after us lodged in a row in the door jamb. A fourth ricocheted upward and left a little round hole haloed with hairline cracks in the glass above the door. Our pursuers did not break into the huts. They locked us in. They hunted down and beat those who had not been quick enough to run inside. A couple of dozen prisoners were wounded or badly beaten. Some lay low and hid their wounds. Others were passed to the medical section for a start, with jail and interrogation as participants in a mutiny to follow. But all this became known only later. The doors were locked overnight, and on the following morning the inmates of different huts were not allowed to meet in the mess hall and piece the story together. In some huts, where no one was seen to be hurt and nothing was known about the killings, the deluded prisoners turned out to work. Our hut was one of them. Out we went, but no one was led through the camp gates after us. The midway was empty. There was no work line-up. We had been tricked. We felt wretched in the engineering shops that day. The lads went from bench to bench and sat down to discuss what had happened the day before and how long we would go on working like donkeys and tamely putting up with it all. Camp veterans, who would never straighten their backs again, were sceptical. What else could we do, they asked. Did we suppose that anyone had ever survived unbroken? This was the philosophy of the 1937 draft. When we returned from work in the dark, the camp area was again deserted. Our scouts ran to the windows of other huts. They found that number nine, in which there were two dead men and three wounded, and the huts next to it, had not gone to work. The bosses had told them about us, hoping that they too would turn out tomorrow. But the way things were, we should obviously not be going in the morning ourselves. 
Notes were tossed over the wall telling the Ukrainians what we had decided and asking for their support. The work stoppage hunger strike had not been carefully prepared. It was not even a coherent concept. And it began impulsively with no directing center, no signal system. Those prisoners in other camps who took over the food stores and then stayed away from work, of course, behaved more sensibly. But our action, if not very clever, was impressive. Three thousand men simultaneously swore off both food and work. Next morning, not a single team sent its man to the bread-cutting room. Not a single team went to the mess hall where broth and mush awaited them. The warders just could not understand it. Twice, three times, four times. They came into the huts to summon us with brisk commands, then to drive us out with threats, then to ask us nicely, no farther than to the mess hall, to collect our bread, with never a word for the present about work line-up. But nobody went. They all lay on their bunks, fully dressed, wearing their shoes, and silent. Only we, the four men, I had become a foreman in that hot year, felt called upon to answer since the warders kept addressing themselves to us. We lay on our bunks like the rest and muttered from our pillows, It's no good, boss. This unanimous quiet defiance of a power which never forgave, this obstinate, painfully protracted insubordination, was somehow more frightening than running and yelling as the bullets fly. In the end, they stopped coaxing us and locked up the huts. In the days that followed, no one left the huts except the orderlies to carry the latrine buckets out and bring drinking water and coal in. Only bed cases in the medical section were by general agreement allowed not to fast. Only doctors and medical orderlies were allowed to work. The kitchens cooked one meal and poured it away, cooked another, poured that away, and cooked no more. The trustees who worked there seemed to have appeared before the camp authorities on the first day, explained that they simply couldn't carry on, and left the kitchens. The bosses could no longer see us, no longer peer into our souls. A gulf had opened between the overseers and the slaves. None of those who took part will ever forget those three days in our lives. We could not see our comrades in other huts, nor the corpses lying there unburied. Nonetheless, the bonds which united us at opposite ends of the deserted camp, were of steel. This was a hunger strike called not by well-fed people with reserves of subcutaneous fat, but by gaunt, emaciated men, who had felt the whip of hunger daily for years on end, who had achieved with difficulty some sort of physical equilibrium, and who suffered acute distress if they were deprived of a single 100-gram ration. Even the goners starved with the rest, although a three-day fast might tip them into irreversible and fatal decline. The food which we had refused, and which we had always thought so beggarly, was a mirage of plenty in the feverish dreams of famished men. This was a hunger strike called by men schooled for decades in the law of the jungle. You die first and I'll die later. Now they were reborn. They struggled out of their stinking swamp. They consented to die today, all of them together rather than to go on living in the same way tomorrow. In the huts, roommates began to treat each other with a sort of ceremonious affection. Whatever scraps of food anyone, this meant mainly those who received parcels, had left, were pooled, placed on a piece of rag spread out like a tablecloth, and then, by joint decision of the whole room, some eatables were shared out and others put aside for the next day. Recipients of parcels might also have quite a bit of food in the personal provision store, but for one thing, no one could cross the camp to fetch it, and for another, not everyone would have been happy to bring his leftovers back with him. He might be counting on them to build him up when the strike was over. For this reason, the strike, like everything that happened in prison, was an unequal ordeal, and the truly brave were those who had nothing in reserve, no hope of recruiting their strength after the strike. If there was any meal, they boiled it at the mouth of the stove and distributed the gruel by the spoonful. To make the fire hotter, they broke planks off the bunks. The couch, provided by the state, is gone, but who cares when his life may not last the night? What the bosses would do, no one could predict. We thought that perhaps they would start firing on the huts again from the towers. The last thing we expected was any concession. 
We had never in our lives wrested anything from them, and our strike had the bitter tang of hopelessness. But there was a sort of satisfaction in this feeling of hopelessness. We had taken a futile, a desperate step. It could only end badly, and that was good. Our bellies were empty, our hearts were in our boots, but some higher need was being satisfied. During those long, hungry days, evenings, nights, three thousand men brooded over their three thousand sentences, their families, their lack of families, all that had befallen and would yet befall them, and although the hearts in thousands of breasts could not beat together, and there were those who felt only regret, only despair, yet most of them kept time. Things are as they should be. We'll keep it up to spite you. Things are bad. So much the better. This, too, is a phenomenon which has never been adequately studied. We do not know the law that governs sudden surges of mass emotion in defiance of all reason. I felt this soaring emotion myself. I had only one more year of my sentence to serve. I might have been expected to feel nothing but dismay and vexation that I was dirtying my hands on a broil from which I should hardly escape without a new sentence. And yet I had no regrets. Damn and blast the lot of you. I'll serve my time all over again, if you like. Next day we saw from our windows a group of officers making their way from hut to hut. A detail of warders opened the door, went along the corridors, looked into the rooms and called us, not in the old way as though we were cattle, but gently. Four men, you're wanted at the entrance. A debate began among us. It was the teams, not their foremen, who had to decide... Men went from room to room to talk it over. Our position was ambiguous. Stoolies had been weeded out from our ranks, but we suspected that there were others, and there were certainly some, like the slippery, bold-faced foreman mechanic, Mikhail Generalov. And anyway, knowledge of human nature told us that many of those on strike and starving for freedom's sake today would spill the beans tomorrow for the sake of a quiet life in chains. For this reason, those who were steering the strike, and there were leaders, of course, did not show themselves but remained underground. They did not openly assume power, and the foremen had openly resigned their authority, so that the strikers seemed to be drifting without a helmsman. A decision was reached at last in some invisible quarter. We foremen, six or seven of us, went out to the entrance where the officers were patiently awaiting us. It was the entrance where that very same hut, number two, until recently a disciplinary barracks from which the metro tunnel had run and the escape hatch itself was a few metres away from the place where we now met. We leaned back against the walls, lowered our eyes and stood like men of stone. We lowered our eyes because not one of us could now look at our bosses psychophantically and rebellious looks would have been foolish. We stood like hardened hooligans called before a teacher's meeting, hunched, hands in pockets, heads lowered and averted, incorrigible, impenetrable, hopeless. From both corridors, however, a crowd of zecks pressed into the entranceway, and hiding behind those in front, the back rows could speak freely, call out our demands and our answers. Officially, the officers with blue-edged epaulettes, some we knew, others we had never seen before, saw and addressed only the foremen. Their manner was restrained. They did not try to intimidate us, but their tone was still intended to remind us that we were inferior. It would, so they said, be in our own interest to end the strike and the hunger strike. If we did, we would receive not only today's rations, but, something unheard of in Gulag, yesterday's too. They were so used to the idea that hungry men can always be bought. Nothing was said either about punishment or about our demands. They might not have existed. The warders stood at the sides, keeping their right hands in their pockets. There were shouts from the corridor. Whoever's to blame for the shooting must be brought to justice. Take the locks off the doors. Off with the numbers. In other huts, they also demanded a review of a special board cases in the open courts. While we four men stood like schoolboy hooligans waiting for the headmaster to finish nagging. The bosses left and the hut was locked up again. Although hunger had begun to get many of us down, our heads were heavy and our thoughts lacked clarity, in our hut not a single voice was raised in favour of surrender. 
any regrets remained unspoken. We tried to guess how high the news of our rebellion would go. They knew already, of course, in the Ministry of Internal Affairs, or would learn today. But did whiskers? That butcher wouldn't stop at shooting the lot of us, all five thousand. Toward evening, we heard the drone of a plane somewhere near, although it was cloudy and not good flying weather. We surmised that someone even higher up had flown in. A seasoned son of Gulag, Nikolai Klebunov, who was friendly with some of us, had landed a job somewhere in the kitchens after 19 years in prison. And as he passed through the camp that day, he was quick enough and brave enough to slip us a half-pooed sack of millet flour through the window. It was shared out between the seven teams and cooked at night so that the warders couldn't catch us at it. Klebunov passed on some very bad news. Camp Division Number Two, where the Ukrainians were, beyond the Chinese Wall, had not supported us. That day and the day before, the Ukrainians had turned out to work as though things were quite normal. There could be no doubt that they had received our notes. They could hear how quiet we had been for two days. They could see from the tower crane on the building site that our camp area had been deserted since the shooting. They must have missed meeting our columns outside the camp. Nevertheless, they had not supported us. We learned afterward that the young men who were their leaders, and who still had no experience of practical politics, had argued that the Ukrainians had their own destiny, distinct from that of the Muscovites. They who had begun with such spirit had now fallen back and abandoned us, so that there were not five thousand of us, but only three. For the second night, the third morning, and the third day, hunger clawed at our guts. But when on the third morning the Czechists, in still greater force, again summoned the four men to the entrance, and once again we stood there, sullen, unreachable, hangdog, our general resolve was not to give way. We were carried along by inertial force. The bosses only gave us new strength. The newly arrived brass hat had this to say: "The administration of the Peschani camp requests the prisoners to take their food. The administration will receive any complaints." It will examine them and eliminate the causes of conflict between the administration and the prisoners. Had our ears deceived us? They were requesting us to take food, and not so much as a word about work. We had stormed the camp jail, broken windows and lamps, chased warders with knives, and it now turned out that far from being a mutiny, this was a conflict between, between equals, between the administration and the prisoners. It had taken only two days and two nights of united action, and look how our serf masters had changed their tone. Never in our lives, not only as prisoners, but as free men, as members of trade unions, had we heard our bosses speak with such unction. Nonetheless, we started silently dispersing. No one could take a decision there, nor could anyone there promise a decision. The four men went away without once raising their eyes or looking around. Even when the head of the separate campsite addressed us one after another by name, that was our answer. The hut was locked again. From outside, it looked to the bosses as dumb and unyielding as ever, but inside the sections were the scene of stormy debate. The temptation was too great. Soft speech had affected the undemanding zecks more than any threat would. Voices were heard urging surrender. What more, indeed, could we hope to achieve? We were tired. We were hungry. The mysterious force which had fused our emotions and borne us aloft was losing height, and with tremulous wings bringing us down to earth again. Yet mouths clamped tight for decades, mouths which had been silent for a lifetime and should have stayed silent for what was left of it, were now opened. Among those listening to them, of course, were the surviving stoolies. These exhortations, in voices suddenly recovered for a few minutes, voices with a new ring to them. In our room, that of Dmitri Panin would have to be paid for by a fresh term of imprisonment, a noose around the throat in which the pulse of freedom had fluttered. It was a price worth paying, for the vocal cords were, for the first time, put to the use for which they were created. Give way now? That would mean accepting someone's word of honor. Whose word exactly? That of our jailers, the camp dog pack. In all the time that prisons had existed, in all the time the camps had been there, had they ever once kept their word? 
The sediment of ancient sufferings and wrongs and insults was stirred up anew. For the first time ever we had taken the right road. Were we to give in so soon? For the first time we had felt what it was like to be human, only to give in so quickly? A keen, a bracing breeze of mischief blew around us. We would go on. We would go on. They'd sing a different tune before we finished. They would give way. But when would we ever be able to believe anything they said? This was as unclear as ever. That is the fate of the oppressed. They are forced to believe and to yield. Once more the emotions of two hundred men were fused in a single passion. The wings of the eagle beat the air. He sailed aloft. We lay down to conserve our strength, trying to move as little as possible and not to talk unnecessarily. Our thoughts were quite enough to occupy us. The last crumbs in the hut had been finished long ago. No one had anything to cook or to share. In the general silence and stillness, the only sound was the voices of young observers glued to the windows. They told us about all the comings and goings outside in the camp. We admired these twenty-year-olds, their enthusiasm undimmed by hunger, their determination to die on the threshold of life, with everything still before them, rather than surrender. We were envious of them, because the truth had entered our heads so late, and our spines were already setting in a servile arc. I can, I think, now mention by name Yannick Baranovsky, Volodya Tromfimov, and Bogdan, the metal worker. Suddenly, in the late afternoon of the third day, when the western sky was clearing, and the setting sun could be seen, our observers shouted in anger and dismay, Hut Nine! Nine has surrendered! Nine's going to the mess hall! We all jumped up. Prisoners from the other side of the corridor ran into our room. Through the bars from the upper and lower bed platforms, some of us on all fours, some looking over other people's shoulders, we watched, transfixed, that sad procession. Two hundred and fifty pathetic little figures, darker than ever against the sunset, cowed and crestfallen, were trailing slantwise across the camp. On they went, each of them glimpsed briefly in the rays of the setting sun, a dawdling, endless chain, as though those behind regretted that the foremost had set out, and were loath to follow. Some, feebler than the rest, were led by the arm or the hand, and so uncertain were their steps that they looked like blind men with their guides. Many, too, held mess tins or mugs in their hands, and this mean prison ware carried, in expectation of a supper too copious to gulp down onto constricted stomachs, these tins and cups, held out like begging bowls, were more degrading and slavish and pitiable than anything else about them. I felt myself weeping. I glanced at my companions as I wiped away my tears and saw theirs. Hut, number nine, had spoken and decided for us all. It was there that the dead had been lying around for four days since Tuesday evening. They went into the mess hall, and it was as though they had decided to forgive the murderers in return for their bread ration and some mush. Number nine was a hungry hut. The teams in it were all general labourers, and very few prisoners received parcels. There were many goners among them. Perhaps they had surrendered for fear that there would be other corpses... We went away from the windows without a word. It was then that I learned the meaning of Polish pride and understood their recklessly brave rebellions. The Polish engineer, Jadzi Wegierski, whom I have mentioned before, was now in our team. He was serving his ninth and last year. Even when he was a worker signer, no one had ever heard him raise his voice. He was always quiet, polite, and gentle. But now... His face was distorted with rage, scorn, and suffering as he tore his eyes away from that procession of beggars and cried in an angry, steely voice, Foreman, don't wake me for supper. I shan't be going. He clambered up onto the top bunk, turned his face to the wall, and didn't get up again. That night we went to eat, but he wouldn't get up. He never received parcels. He was quite alone. He was always short of food but he wouldn't get up. In his mind's eye, the steam from a bowl of mush could not veil the ideal of freedom. If we had all been so proud and so strong, what tyrant could have held out against us? 
The following day, January the 27th, was a Sunday. They didn't drive us out to work to make up for lost time, although the bosses, of course, were itching to get back on schedule, but simply fed us, issued arrears of rations, and let us wander about the camp. We all went from hut to hut, telling each other how we had felt in the past few days, and we were all in holiday mood, as though we had won instead of losing. Besides, our kind masters promised yet again that all legitimate requests, but who knew who was to define what was legitimate? would be satisfied. There was, however, one untoward little event, a certain Volodka Ponomarev, a bitch, who had been with us throughout the strike, heard many rash speeches and looked into many eyes, ran away to the guardhouse, which meant that he had run to betray us outside the camp area, where he could avoid the knife. For me, the whole essence of the criminal world crystallized in Ponomarev's flight. Their alleged nobility is just a matter of caste obligations, but when they find themselves in the whirlpool of revolution, they inevitably behave treacherously. They can understand no principles, only brute force. It was an easy guess that our bosses were getting ready to arrest the ringleaders, but they announced that, on the contrary, commissions of inquiry had arrived from Karaganda, Alma-Ata, and Moscow to look into things. A table was placed on ground, stiff with hoarfrost, in the middle of the camp, where we lined up for work assignment, and some high-ranking officers sat at it in sheepskin coats and felt boots, and invited us to come forward with our complaints. Many prisoners went and talked to them. Notes were taken. After work on Tuesday, they assembled the four men to present complaints. In reality, this conference was another low trick, a form of interrogation. They knew that the prisoners were boiling with resentment and let them vent it so that they could be sure of arresting the right people. This was my last day as a foreman. My neglected tumour was growing rapidly, and for a long time now I'd been putting off my operation until, in camp terms, it was convenient. In January, and particularly during the fatal days of the hunger strike, the tumour decided for me that it was now convenient, and it seemed to get bigger by the hour. The moment the huts were opened, I showed myself to the doctors, and they set a date for the operation. But I dragged myself to this last conference. It was convened in the spacious anteroom to the bathhouse. They placed the presidium's table in front of the barber's chairs, and seated at it were one MVD colonel, several lieutenant colonels, and some smaller fry, with our camp commanders inconspicuous in the second row behind them. There, too, behind the backs of the presidium, sat the note-takers, making hasty notes throughout the meeting, while the front row helped them by repeating the names of speakers. One man stood out from the rest, a certain lieutenant colonel from the special section or from the organs, a quick, clever, nimble-witted villain, with a tall brow and a long face. This quick-wittedness, these narrow features, somehow made it difficult to believe that he belonged to that pack of obtuse police officials. The four men were reluctant to come forward and practically had to be dragged to their feet from the close-packed benches. As soon as they started saying something of their own, they were interrupted and invited to explain why people were being murdered and what were the aims of the strikers. And if a hapless foreman tried to give some sort of answer to the questions, reason for murders, nature of demands, the whole pack at once flung itself upon him. And how do you know that? So you're connected with these gangsters. Right, let's have their names. This was their idea of a fair and honourable inquiry into the legitimacy of our demands. The lofty-browed villain of a lieutenant colonel was especially quick to interrupt the speakers. He had a nimble tongue and the advantage of impunity. With his caustic interjections, he thwarted each of our attempts to present our case. From the tone which the proceedings were beginning to take, you would have thought that only we faced any charges and needed to defend ourselves. An urge to put a stop to this swelled inside me. I took the floor and gave my name, which was repeated for the note-taker. I rose from the bench, pretty certain there was no one in that gathering who could trot out a rounded sentence more easily than I. The only difficulty was that I had no idea what to tell them. All that is written in these pages all that we had gone through, all that we had brooded over in all those years and all those days on hunger strike. I might as well try telling it to orangutans as to them. They were still in some formal sense Russians, 
still more or less capable of understanding fairly simple Russian phrases, such as permission to enter, permission to speak, sir. But as they sat there all in a row at the long table, exhibiting their sleek, white, complacent, uniformly blank physiognomies, it was plain that they had long ago degenerated into a distinct biological type, that verbal communication between us had broken down beyond repair, and that we could exchange only bullets. Only the long-headed one had not yet turned into an orangutan. His hearing and understanding were excellent. The moment I spoke, he tried to interrupt me. With the whole audience paying close attention, a duel of lightning-swift repartee began. Where do you work? What difference could that make, I wonder? In the engineering shops, I rapped out over my shoulder and hurried on with more important things. He came straight back at me. Where they make the knives? No, I said, parrying his thrust. Where they repair self-propelled excavators? I don't know myself how my mind worked so quickly and clearly. Hurry, hurry, make them be quiet and listen. That's the main thing. The brute crouched behind the table and suddenly pounced to sink his fangs in me. You are here because the bandits delegated you. No, because you invited me. I snapped back triumphantly and went on talking and talking. He sprang at me once or twice more, was beaten off and sat completely silent. I had won. One, but to what purpose? Just one more year? One more year to go and the thought crushed me. I could not get out the words they deserved to hear. I could have delivered there and then an immortal speech and been shot next day. I would have delivered it just the same if they had been broadcasting it throughout the world. But no, the audience was too small. So I did not tell them that our camps followed the fascist model and were a symptom of the regime's degeneration. I limited myself to waving a kerosene-soaked rag under their eagerly sniffing noses. I had learned that the commander of convoy troops was sitting there, and so I deplored the unworthy conduct of the camp guards, who had ceased to resemble Soviet fighting men, who joined in pilfering from work sites, and they were boors and bullies, and they were murderers into the bargain. Then I portrayed the warders in the camps as a gang of greedy rogues who forced Zex to steal building materials for them. This is quite true, except that it started with the officers sitting and listening to me. And what a counter-educational effect all this had, I said, on prisoners desirous of amendment. I didn't like my speech myself. The only good thing about it was that we were now setting the pace. In the interval of silence which I had won, one of the four men, T, rose and spoke slowly, almost inarticulately, whether because that was natural to him or because he was extremely agitated. I used to agree when other prisoners said, we live like dogs. The brute in the presidium bristled. T needed the cap in his hands, an ugly, crop-headed convict, his coarsened features contorted by his struggle to find the right words. But now I see that I was wrong. The brute's face cleared. We live much worse than dogs, T rapped out with sudden emphasis and all the four men sat bolt upright. A dog has only one number on his collar. We have four. Dogs are fed on meat. We're fed on fish bones. A dog doesn't get put in the cooler. A dog doesn't get shot at from watchtowers. Dogs don't get twenty-fivers pinned on them. They could interrupt whenever they liked now. He had said all that mattered. Chernogorov rose, introducing himself as a hero of the Soviet Union. Then another foreman and both of them spoke boldly and passionately. Their names were echoed in the Presidium with heavy significance. Maybe this can only lead to our destruction, lads, and maybe it is only by banging our heads against it that we can bring this accursed wall down. The meeting ended in a draw. All was quiet for a few days, the Commission was seen no more, and life was so peaceful in our camp division that there might never have been any trouble. An escort took me off to hospital on the Ukrainian side. I was the first to be taken there since the hunger strike, the first swallow. Yanchenko, the surgeon who was to operate on me, had called me in for examination, but his questions and my answers were not about my tumour. He was not interested in my tumour, and I was glad to have such a reliable doctor. There was no end to his questions. His face was dark with the pain we all shared. 
The same experience in different lives can be seen in very different perspectives. This tumour, which was to all appearances malignant, what a blow it would have been if I were a free man, how I should have suffered, how my loved ones would have wept. But in this place, where heads were so casually severed from trunks, the same tumour was just an excuse to stay in bed, and I didn't give it much thought. I was lying in the hospital among those wounded and maimed on that bloody night. There were men beaten by the warders to a bloody pulp. They had nothing left to lie on. Their flesh was in ribbons. One burly warder had been particularly brutal with his length of iron piping. Memory, memory, I cannot now recall his name. One man had already died of his wounds. News came in thick and fast. The punitive operation had begun in the Russian camp division. Forty men had been arrested. For fear of a fresh mutiny, they did it this way. Until the very last day, the bosses showed nothing but kindness, and you could only suppose that they were trying to decide which of their own number were to blame. But on the appointed day, as the work teams were passing through the gates, they noticed that the escort party which took charge of them was twice or three times its normal strength. The plan was to seize the victims where prisoners could not help one another, nor could the walls of huts or buildings under construction help them. The escort marched the columns out of the camp and took them by different ways into the steppe, but before they had brought any of them to their destination, the officers in command gave their orders, Halt! Weapons at the ready! Chamber cartridges! Prisoners, sit down! I shall count to three and fire if you aren't sitting down! Everybody, sit! Once again, as at Epiphany the year before, tricked and helpless, the slaves were pinned to the snow. Then, too, an officer had unfolded a piece of paper and read out the names and numbers of those who had to rise, leave the unresisting herd, and pass through the cordon. Next, this handful of mutineers was marched back under separate escort, or else a black maria rolled up to collect them. The herd, now purged of fermenting agents, was then brought to its feet and driven to work. Our educators had shown us whether we could ever believe anything, they said. They also plucked out candidates for jail in the camp grounds while they were deserted for the day, and arrests easily flitted over that four-meter wall which the strike had been unable to surmount and pecked at the Ukrainian camp division. The very day before my operation was due, Yanchenko, the surgeon, was arrested and taken off to jail. Prisoners continued to be arrested or posted to other camps, it was always difficult to know which, without the precautions observed at the beginning. Small groups of twenty or thirty were sent off somewhere. Then suddenly, on February the 19th, they began assembling an enormous transport, some seven hundred strong. They were under special discipline. As they left the camp, they were handcuffed. Fate had exacted retribution. The Ukrainians, who had taken such good care not to help the Muscovites, were thicker on the ground in this transport than we were. True, on the point of leaving, they saluted our shattered strike. A new wood processing plant, itself oddly enough built entirely of wood, in Kazakhstan where there is no timber and lots of stone, for reasons which remained officially unexplained, but I know for certain that there was arson, burst into flame at several points simultaneously, and within two hours three million rubles had gone up in smoke. For those on their way to be shot, it was like a Viking's funeral, the old Scandinavian custom of burning the hero's boat together with his body. I was lying in the recovery room. I was alone in the ward. The camp was in such a turmoil that no one could be admitted. The hospital had come to a standstill. After my room, which was at the butt end of the hut, came the morgue, where Dr. Kornfeld's body had been lying for I don't know how many days, because no one had time to bury him. Morning and evening, a warder nearing the end of his round would stop outside, and to simplify the count, embrace my room and the morgue in one inclusive gesture. Two more here, and tick us off on his clipboard. Pavel Boronyuk, who had also been called to join the large transport, broke through all the cordons and came to embrace me before he left. Not just our camp, but the whole of creation seemed to us to be shaken, reeling before the storm. We were storm-tossed, and we could not realize that outside the camp all was as calm and stagnant as ever. We felt as though we were riding great waves on something that might sink under our feet, and that if we ever saw each other again, it would be in quite a different country. But just in case, 
Farewell, my friend. Farewell, all my friends. That year of tedium and stupidity, my last year in Ekibastuts and the last Stalinist year on the archipelago, dragged on. After they had been kept in jail for a while and no evidence against them found, a few, but only a few, were sent back into the camp, while many, very many, whom we had come to know and love over the years were taken away, some for further investigation and trial, others to the isolator because of some indelible black mark in their dossiers, although they might long since have been more like angels than prisoners. Others again to the Jezkazgan mines, and there was even a transport of the mentally defective. Kishkin the Joker was squeezed in with this lot, and the doctors also fixed up Volodya Gershuni. To replace those who had left, the stoolies crawled one by one out of the safe deposit, timidly and apprehensively at first, then more and more brazenly. One who returned to the body of the camp was the venal bitch, Volodka Ponomorev, once a mere lathe operator, but now in charge of the parcels room. The distribution of the precious crumbs collected by destitute families was a task which the old Czechist Maximenko naturally entrusted to a notorious thief. The security officers again started summoning anyone and everyone to their offices as often as they pleased. It was an airless spring. Anyone whose horns or ears stuck out too much quickly learned to keep his head down. I did not go back to my foreman's job. There were now plenty of foremen again, but became a smelter's mate in the foundry. We had to work hard that year for reasons which I shall explain. The one and only concession which the administration made when all our hopes and demands lay in ruins was to make us self-financing. Under this system, what we produced did not simply vanish into the maw of Gulag, but was priced, and 45% of its value was counted as our earnings. The rest went to the state. Of these earnings, the camp appropriated 70% for the maintenance of guards, dogs, barbed wire, the camp jail, security officers, the officers responsible for discipline, for censorship, for education, in a word, all the things without which our lives would be unlivable. But the remaining 30%, 13.5% of the whole product, was credited to the personal account of the prisoner, and part of this money, though not all of it, provided you had not misbehaved, not been late, not been rude, not been a disappointment to your bosses, you could on application once a month convert into a new camp currency, vouchers, and these vouchers you could spend. The system was so contrived that the more sweat you lost, the more blood you gave, the closer you came to that 30%. But if you didn't feel like breaking your back, all your labor went to the camp and you got zero. And the majority, ah, what a part the majority plays in our history, especially when it is carefully prepared by weeding, gratefully gulped down this sop from its bosses and risked working itself to death to buy condensed milk, margarine and nasty sweets at the food counter, or get itself a second supper in the commercial dining room. And since worksheets were made up for the team as a whole, not for individual members, all those who didn't want to sacrifice their health for margarine still had to do it so that their comrades could earn more. They also started bringing films to the camp much more frequently than before. As is always the case in the camps or in villages or in remote workers' settlements, no one had enough respect for the spectators to announce the titles in advance. A pig, after all, is not informed in advance what is going to be poured into his trough. Nonetheless, the prisoners... Could they be the same prisoners who had kept up the hunger strike so heroically that winter? Now flocked in, grabbed seats an hour before the windows were draped, without worrying one little bit whether the film was worth it. Bread and circuses, such a cliché that it's embarrassing to repeat it. No one could blame people for wanting to eat their fill after so many years of hunger, but while we were there filling our bellies, comrades of ours, some who had taught us to fight, some who had shouted, no surrender, to their hutmates in those January days, and some who had not been involved at all, were at that moment on trial somewhere. Comrades of ours were being shot or carried off to begin new sentences in isolation camps, or broken by interrogation after interrogation, 
bundled into cells where condemned men had scratched a forest of crosses on the walls, and the snake of a major looked in to smile a promise. Ah, Panin, I remember you. Oh, yes, I remember you. The wheels are turning, don't worry. We'll soon process you. A fine word, that, process. You can process a man for the next world, process a man into the cooler for twenty-four hours, and a chit for a pair of second-hand trousers may also be processed. But the door slams shut, the snake is gone, smiling enigmatically, leaving you to guess, to spend a month without sleep, to beat your head against the stones, wondering how exactly they intend to process you. Talking about it is easy enough. Suddenly, in Ekibastuts, they got together another party of twenty men for transportation. Rather a strange party. They were gathered unhurriedly, they were not treated harshly, they were not isolated. It was almost as though they were being assembled for release. Not one of them, however, was anywhere near the end of his sentence. Nor were there any of those hard-boiled zecks among them whom the bosses try to break with spells in the cooler and special punishments. No, they were all good prisoners in good standing with their superiors. There, once again, was the slippery and self-assured foreman of the vehicle repair shop, Mikhail Mikhailovich Generalov, the crafty simpleton Belusov, a foreman machinist, the engineer and technician Gultyayev, the Moscow designer Leonid Raikov, a grave and steady man with the face of a statesman, the very amiable, universally friendly Zhenka Milyukov, a lathe operator with a pert pancake face. And another lathe operator, the Georgian, Koki Kocherova, a great lover of truth, hot in defense of justice when the crowd was looking. Where were they going? From the party's composition, obviously not to a maximum punishment prison. Must be a nice place you're going to, they were told. They'll be taking the guards off you. But not one of them showed a glimmer of happiness, not for a single moment. They wagged their heads miserably, reluctantly gathered their belongings, in two minds as to whether to take them or leave them. They looked like beaten curs. Could they really have grown so fond of turbulent ekibastuts? They even said goodbye with lips that seemed numb and unconvincing intonations. They were taken away. We were not given time to forget them. Three weeks later the word went around. They'd been brought back. Back here? Yes. All of them? Yes. Only they're sitting in the staff barracks and won't go to their own huts. This put the finishing touch to the strike of three thousand at Ekebastuts. The strike of the traitors. So much for their reluctance to go. In the interrogators' offices, when they were snitching on our friends and signing their perfidious statements, they had hoped they would all be kept under the seal of the confessional. It had, of course, been that way for decades. A political denunciation was regarded as an unchallengeable document, and the informer's identity was never revealed. But something about our strike, the need perhaps to vindicate themselves in the eyes of their superiors, had compelled our bosses to mount a full-dress trial somewhere in Karaganda. These creatures were taken off one day, and when they looked into each other's anxious eyes, each of them realized that he and all the others were on their way to testify in court. That wouldn't have bothered them, but they knew Gulag's post-war rule, a prisoner called away for some temporary purpose, must be returned to his former camp. They were, however, promised that, by way of exception, they would be left in Karaganda. An order was in fact drafted, but incorrectly, not in due form, and Karaganda refused to have them. They were three weeks on the road. Their guards herded them from Stolypin cars into transit camps, and from transit camps into Stolypin cars, yelled at them to sit on the ground, searched them, took away their belongings, rushed them into the bathhouse, fed them on herrings, and gave them no water. They received the full treatment used to wear down ordinary uncooperative prisoners. Then they were taken under guard into the courtroom, where they faced yet again those whom they had denounced, this time to drive the final nails into their coffins, hang the locks on the doors of their solitary cells, wind back their sentences so that they would have long years to run, after which they were brought home by all those transit prisons and flung without their masks into their old camp. They were no longer needed. Informers 
are like ferrymen. But was not the camp now pacified? Had not nearly a thousand men been moved out? Could anybody now prevent them from going along to the Godfather's office? Nevertheless, they wouldn't leave the staff building. They were on strike. They refused to enter the camp grounds. Only Kuchepara made up his mind to brazen it out in his old role of lover of truth. He went to his team and said, We don't know why they took us. They took us all over the place and then brought us back. But his daring lasted just one night and one dawn. Next day he fled to the staff room and his friends. So that what had happened had not gone for nothing, and our comrades had not fallen in vain. The atmosphere in the camp would never be as oppressive as before. Meanness was back on its throne, but very precariously. Politics were freely discussed in the huts. No worker signer or foreman would dare kick a zek or take a swing at him because everybody knew now how easy it is to make knives and how easily they sink home between the ribs. Our little island had experienced an earthquake and ceased to belong to the archipelago. This was how Ekebastuts felt. It is doubtful whether Karaganda felt the same, and certain that Moscow did not. The special camp system was beginning to collapse in one place after another, but our father and teacher had no inkling of it, it was not, of course, reported to him, and in any case, incapable as he was of giving up anything, he would only have relinquished Katorga on the day his chair burst into flames beneath him. On the contrary, he planned a new great wave of arrests for 1953, perhaps in connection with a new war, and in 1952 expanded the special camp network accordingly. Thus it was decreed that the Ekebastut's camp should be converted from a division of Steplag, or at times Peschanlag, into the headquarters of a big new special camp complex in the Irtish Basin, provisionally called Dalag, so that, over and above the numerous slave drivers already there, a whole new administration of parasites arrived in Ekebastut's, and these as well we had to support by our labour. New prisoners, too, were expected any day. Meanwhile, the germ of freedom was spreading. Where, though, could it go from the archipelago? Just as the Dubovka prisoners had once brought it to us, so our comrades now carried it farther. That spring you could see this inscription written, scratched, or chiseled on every lavatory wall in Kazakhstan. Hail to the fighters of Ekibashtuts! The first culling of the center mutineers, about 40 men and the 250 most hardened cases among the big February transport, were taken all the way to Kangir. The settlement was called Kangir and the station Jez Kazgan. This was the third Steplag camp division where the Steplag administration and the big-bellied Colonel Chechev in person were to be found. The other Ekibastut's prisoners to be punished were shared between the first and second divisions of Steplag, Rudnik. To warn them off, the 8,000 Zeks of Kangir were informed that the new arrivals were bandits. They were marched all the way from the station to Kangir Jail's new building in handcuffs. In this way, like a legend in chains, our movement entered still servile Kangir to awaken it, too. Here, as in Ekibashtuts a year back, the bully and the informer still reigned supreme. When he had kept our quarter thousand in jail till April, the commander of the Kangir Camp Division, Lieutenant Colonel Fedotov, decided that they had been sufficiently intimidated and gave instructions for them to be taken out to work. The centre had supplied 125 pairs of brand-new nickel-plated handcuffs, latest fascist design, just enough if you handcuffed them two together for 250 prisoners, which was probably how they had determined Kangir's allocation. With one hand free, life is not so bad. Quite a few of the lads in the column had experience of camp jails, and there were also old escapers among them. Tenno, too, was included in the transport, who knew all the peculiarities of handcuffs, and explained to neighbours in the column that with one hand free, there was nothing to getting these cuffs off, with a pin or even without one. When they got near the working area, the warders began removing handcuffs at several places in the column simultaneously, so as to start the day's work without delay. Whereupon, those who knew how hurriedly took off their own handcuffs and those of other prisoners and hid them under their coats. Another warder took ours off. 
It never occurred to the warders to count the handcuffs before they let the column pass, and prisoners were never searched on entering their place of work. So that on the very first morning, out of 125 pairs of handcuffs, our lads carried off 23. There, in the work zone, they started by smashing the cuffs with stones and hammers, but soon they had a brighter idea, wrapping them in greased paper so that they would last better, and bricking them up in the walls and foundations of the buildings on which they were working that day, residential block number 20 opposite the Kengia Palace of Culture, together with ideologically uninhibited covering notes. Descendants, these houses were built by Soviet slaves. Here you see the sort of handcuffs they wore. The warders abused and cursed the bandits and produced some rusty old cuffs for the return journey. They were very much on their guard now, but the lads still pinched another six pairs on the way into camp. On each of the two following working days, they stole a few more, and every pair cost ninety-three rubles. So the bosses of Kengir declined to march the lads about in handcuffs. A man must fight for his rights. At about the beginning of May, they gradually started transferring the Ekebastut's group from the jail to the main camp. The time had come for them to teach the locals a little sense. As a beginning, they mounted a small demonstration. A trustee, barging in at the head of a queue, as was his right, was strangled, not quite fatally. This was enough to start people talking. Things are going to change around here. The new lot aren't like us. It would be untrue to say that in the nest of camps around Zhezh Kazgan, stoolies had never been touched, but this had not become a trend. In 1951, in the jail at Rudnik, prisoners once snatched a warder's keys, unlocked the cell they wanted, and knifed Kozlowskas. Underground centres were now set up in Kengir, one Ukrainian, one all-Russian. Knives and masks were made, ready for the chopping, and the whole story began all over again. Voynilovich hanged himself from the bars of his cell. Others killed were the foreman Belokopit and the loyalist Stuli Lipschitz, a member of the Revolutionary Military Committee with the forces facing Dutov during the Civil War. Lipschitz had lived happily in the Rudnik Camp Division, where he was librarian in the Culture and Education section, but his fame had preceded him, and he was knifed the day after his arrival at Kengir. A Hungarian maintenance orderly was hacked to death with axes near the bathhouse. The first to flee and blaze a trail to the safe deposit was Sauer, a former minister in Soviet Estonia. But by now the camp bosses, too, knew what to do. For a long time past there had been walls between the four camp divisions at Kangir. The idea now was to surround each hut with a wall of its own, and 8,000 men started working on it in their spare time. They also partitioned every hut into four sections, with no communication between them. Each miniature camp area and each section was regularly locked. Ideally, of course, they would have liked to divide the whole world into one-man compartments. The sergeant major in charge of the Kangir jail was a professional boxer. He used prisoners as punching bags. In his jail, they had also invented a technique of beating prisoners with mallets through a layer of plywood so as to leave no marks. These Practical MVD personnel knew that re-education was impossible without beatings and murders, and any practical public prosecutor would agree. But there was always the danger that some theorist might descend on them. It was this rather improbable visiting theorist who made the interposed plywood necessary. One Western Ukrainian, tortured beyond endurance and afraid that he might betray his friends, hanged himself. Others behaved worse and both centres were put out of business. What is more, there were among the fighters some greedy rascals interested not in the success of the movement, but in feathering their nests. They wanted extra food brought to them from the kitchen, and a share in other prisoners' food parcels. Among those who take the path of violence, this is probably inevitable. I do not see Camo's raiders leaving themselves with empty pockets when they paid the proceeds of their bank robberies into party funds. And can we imagine Koba, who directed their operations, leaving himself without money for wine? During the Civil War, when consumption of wine and spirits was prohibited throughout Soviet Russia, he kept a wine cellar in the Kremlin, more or less openly. This helped the authorities to discredit the movement and put a stop to it. Or so they thought. 
but the stoolies too sang smaller after this first rehearsal. At least the atmosphere in Kengir was cleaner. The seed had been sown, but the crop would be late, and a surprise. We are forever being told that individuals do not mould history, especially when they resist the course of progress. But for a quarter of a century, one such individual twisted our tails as if we were sheep, and we did not even dare to squeal. Now they say that nobody understood. The rear didn't understand. The vanguard didn't understand. Only the oldest of the old guard understood, and they chose to poison themselves in corners, shoot themselves in the privacy of their homes, or end their days as meek pensioners, rather than cry out to us from a public platform. So the lot of the liberator fell upon us little ones, in ekibashtuts by putting five thousand pairs of shoulders under those prison vaults and heaving. We had at least caused a crack, only a little one, perhaps unnoticeable at a distance. And perhaps we had overstrained ourselves, but cracks make caves collapse. There were other disturbances besides ours, besides those in the special camps. But the whole bloody past has been so carefully cleaned up and painted and polished that it is impossible for me now to establish even a bare list of disorders in the camps. I did learn by chance that in 1951, in the Vachrushevo corrective labour camp on Sakhalin. Five hundred men were on hunger strike for five days, with excitement running high and selective arrests. After three runaways had been savagely bayoneted outside the guardhouse, we know of a serious disturbance in Odzelag on September the eighth, nineteen fifty-two, after a man had been killed in the ranks at the guardhouse. Evidently, the Stalinist camp system, particularly in the special camps, was nearing a crisis at the beginning of the fifties. Even in the Almighty One's lifetime, the natives were beginning to tear at their chains. There is no knowing how things would have gone if he had lived, as it was, for reasons which had nothing to do with the laws of economics or society. The sluggish and impure blood suddenly stopped flowing in the senile veins of that undersized and pockmarked individual. According to the vanguard doctrine, no change should have resulted from this. Nor did the blue caps fear any change, though they wept outside the main gates on March the fifth. Nor did the men in black jerkins dare to hope for change, though they strummed on their balalikas. They were not let out of the camp grounds that day, when they discovered that funeral marches were being broadcast and that black bordered flags had been hung out. Yet some obscure convulsion, some slippage, was started underground. True, the amnesty at the end of March 1953, known to the camps as the Boroshilov amnesty, was utterly faithful to the spiritual legacy of the deceased, in its tenderness for thieves and its viciousness towards politicals. To curry favour with the underworld, the authors of the amnesty released the thieves upon the land like a plague of rats, leaving ordinary citizens to suffer, to bar their windows and make jails of their homes, and leaving the militia to hunt down all over again. All those it had ever caught, whereas fifty-eights were released in the normal ratio. Of the three thousand men at Number Two Camp Division in Kangia, the number set free was three. An amnesty like this could convince those in Katorga of one thing only: that Stalin's death had changed nothing. No mercy had ever been shown them, and it would not be shown now. If they wanted some sort of life on this earth, they must fight for it. Disturbances in the camps continued in various places in 1953. Minor brawls like that in Karlag, Camp Division Number Twelve, and a major rebellion at Gorlag, Norilsk, about which a separate chapter would now follow, if we had any material at all. But there is none. However, the tyrant did not die in vain. Something hidden from view slipped and shifted, and suddenly, with a tinny clatter like an empty bucket falling. Yet another individual came tumbling headlong from the very top of the ladder into the muckiest of bogs, and now everyone, the vanguard, the rear, even the most wretched natives of Gulag, realized that a new age had arrived. To us on the archipelago, Beria's fall was like a thunderclap. He was the supreme patron, the viceroy of the archipelago. 
MVD officers were perplexed, embarrassed, dismayed. When the news was announced over the radio, they would have liked to stuff this horror back into the loudspeaker, but had instead to lay hands on the portraits of their dear, kind protector, take them down from the walls at Steplak's headquarters. It's all over now, Colonel Chechev said with quivering lips. But he was mistaken. He thought that they would all be put on trial the very next day. As Kliochevsky notes, the very day after the emancipation of the gentry, decree on rights of the gentry, February the 18th, 1762, the peasants were also freed, February the 19th, 1861, but after an interval of 99 years. The officers and warders suddenly showed an uncertainty, a bewilderment even, of which the prisoners were keenly aware. The disciplinary officer of Camp Division No. 3 at Kangir, from whom no prisoner had ever received a kind look, suddenly came up to a team from the disciplinary barracks while they were working, sat down, and started offering them cigarettes. He wanted to see what sparks were flying in that turbid atmosphere and what danger could be expected from them. "'What do you say to that, then?' they asked him mockingly. "'Was your top boss really an enemy of the people?' Uh, "'Yes, as it turns out.' said the disciplinary officer dolefully. He was Stalin's right hand, though, said the maliciously grinning prisoners. So that means even Stalin slipped up, doesn't it? Uh, yes, said the amiable chatterbox. Well, lads, it looks as though they'll be letting you out if you're patient. Beria had fallen, and he had bequeathed the blot on his name to his faithful organs, until then, no prisoner and no free man, if he valued his life, had dared even to think of doubting the crystalline purity of each and every MVD officer. But now it was enough to call one of these reptiles a barrierite, and he was defenseless. In Reschlag, Vorkuta, in June 1953, the great excitement caused by Beria's removal coincided with the arrival of the mutineers transported from Karaganda and Taishet. Most were Western Ukrainians. Borkuta was still servile and downtrodden, and the newly arrived Zex astounded the locals with their intransigence and their audacity. And the process that had taken us several long months was completed here in one month's time. On July the 22nd, the cement works, building project TTS-2, and pits number 7, number 29, and number 6 struck. The prisoners at these work sites could see each other stopping work, see the wheels and the pit frames coming to a standstill. This time there was no repetition of our mistake at Ekibastuts, no hunger strike. The warders, to a man, immediately fled from the camp grounds, but every day, to yells of, Hand over the rations, boss man! They trundled provisions up to the fence and shoved them through the gates. I suppose the fall of Beria had made them so conscientious, but for that... They would have starved the prisoners out. Strike committees were set up in the camp divisions affected. Revolutionary order was established. The mess hall staff immediately stopped stealing, and although rations were not increased, the food improved noticeably. At pit number 7 they hung out a red flag, and at number 29, on the side facing a nearby railway line, they put up portraits of the Politburo. What could they display, and what could they demand? They demanded that number patches, window bars, and locks be taken off, but touched none of these things themselves. They demanded the right to correspond, the right to receive visits, and a review of their cases. On the first day only, attempts were made to talk the strikers out of it. Then nobody came near for a week, but machine guns were set up on the watchtowers, and the camp divisions on strike were cordoned off. No doubt the brass was scurrying back and forth between Vorkuta and Moscow, it was hard to know what to do in the new circumstances. At the end of that week, General Maslenikov, the head of Reschlag, General Derenko, and the prosecutor general, Rudenko, started going around the camp with a large suite of officers, as many as forty. Everyone was assembled on the camp parade ground to meet this glittering train. The prisoners sat on the ground while the generals showered abuse on them for sabotage and disgraceful behavior. At the same time, they conceded that some of the demands are well-founded. You can take off your number patches. Orders have been given about the window bars. But the prisoners must return to work at once. The country needs coal. At pit number seven, somebody shouted from the back, 
And what we need is freedom, you dirty... And prisoners began to rise from the ground and disperse, leaving the generals with no audience. According to other accounts, they actually put up this slogan, Freedom for us, coal for our country. Freedom for us is in itself seditious, of course, so they hastily added coal for our country by way of apology. At this point, they tore off number patches and began levering out window bars. However, a schism immediately developed and their spirits fell. Perhaps we've gone far enough. We shan't get any more out of them. Part of the night shift reported, and the whole day shift. The pit wheel started turning again, and the various sites watched each other resume work. Pit 29, however, was behind a hill and could not see the others. It was told that all the rest had started work, but did not believe it, and did not go back. It would obviously have been no trouble to take delegates from Pit 29 over to the other pits, but to make such a fuss over prisoners would have been demeaning, and anyway the generals were thirsting for blood. Without blood, there's no victory. Without blood, these dumb brutes would never learn. On August the 11th, eleven truckloads of soldiers drove up to Pit 29. The prisoners were called out onto the parade ground toward the gate. On the other side of the gate was a serried mass of soldiers. Report for work or we shall take harsh measures. Never mind what measures. Just look at the Tommy guns. There was silence than the movement of human molecules in the crowd. Why risk your neck, especially if you have a short sentence? Those with a year or two to go pushed their way forward. But there were others who forced a path through the ranks to stand in the front row, link arms and form a barrier against the strike breakers. The crowd was undecided. An officer tried to break the cordon and was struck with an iron bar. General Derevyanko withdrew to one side and gave the order, Fire! on the crowd. There were three volleys with machine gun fire in between. Sixty-six men were killed. Who were the victims? The front rows, that is to say the most fearless and also those who had weakened first. This is a law with a wide application. You will even find it expressed in Proverbs. The rest ran away. Guards with clubs and iron bars rushed after the Zex, beating them and driving them out of camp. Arrests continued for three days, August the 1st to the 3rd, in all the camp divisions which had been on strike. But what could be done with those arrested? The organs had lost their cutting edge since the death of their breadwinner. They could not rise to a formal investigation. More special trains, more transfers hither and thither to spread the epidemic more widely. The archipelago was becoming uncomfortably small. For those who were left behind, there was a special punitive regime. A number of thin wooden patches appeared on the roofs of huts at pit number 29, covering the bullet holes made by soldiers firing over the heads of the crowd. Unknown soldiers who refused to become murderers. But there were plenty of others who hit the target. Near the slag heap at pit 29, somebody in Khrushchev's day raised a cross with a tall stem like a telegraph pole on the communal grave. Then it was knocked down, and someone put it up again. I do not know whether it is still standing. 